I think we'll go over to caching. Now, I know caching has been a, a hot topic, uh, much debate, and a lot of people are going to call me next year's fanboy for this, and I'll be honest, I am. Uh, but I kind of like how caching works right now. And <clears throat> hear me out. And the reason why, and I don't know if this is the logic behind why you guys set it up this way, is I'd rather things be cached by default and then have to remove if I need to, have to make it dynamic if I need to. I think I found setting up caching myself to be a bit more challenging. Not that it's hard, but there's maybe unforeseen edge cases until you actually put into production. And I'd just rather not have that issue. Um, like in the previous startup I was in, I was building, there's a lot of issues in that realm. So is that kind of the idea behind having things cached by default or was it something else? Yeah, I think everyone wants the same thing. They want to have their app be fast by default, ideally as fast as possible. And caching is hard, especially for people just getting started with web development, just learning React, getting into the server and how caching in the web works. Um, just doing a basic cache isn't necessarily that difficult. You can use some cache control headers, but it definitely ramps in complexity. You know, mm -hmm. that's why the joke we already talked about naming, but then mm -hmm. caching another one of the hard things in computer science. Uh, we've, <laughs> we've covered two of them. Um, I think that what I've found talking to a lot of people about caching in Next.js is that a lot of folks use the word caching and pre-rendering uh, interchangeably. Mm -hmm. And they're actually, two different things. I think about them completely differently, but it helps understand for me at least why people have felt like caching was confusing because in your application, you have some data fetching, you go talk to your database, you go talk to an API, and then you do a production build. And this production build is trying to help make your site as fast as possible. The way Next.js has worked since Next.js 9 is that we have this thing called automatic static optimization, which basically means if I'm not fetching data, if I'm not doing anything that requires some IO, some input output, I can just make that a static page. It can be guaranteed fast. And then the next version of the Next.js pages router was, well, let's have these specific functions that allow you to opt whether you're in the static world or the dynamic world. So if I use a git, uh, git static props, yeah. I'm guaranteed that this page is always going to be fast. One of the opportunities with the app router is that you can mix these components, some that are static and some that are dynamic. But to do that, you want to understand what it means to use dynamic code, but still ideally make the initial load of your page as fast as possible. So the parts that aren't dynamic, ideally, you just want those to be static. So really what folks are asking for is a way to pre-render as much of the page as possible. Sense. Because if you're fetching data from a bunch of places, but actually you don't need it to be updated very often, maybe once a day, maybe every build is fine. Great. When we do next build, we'll just update that and we'll generate the HTML. And then if there's dynamic parts, we want to handle those components differently. So the reason why we're making a change in Next.js 15 to change the default caching behavior is to help well, it's two things. One is to help prepare people for the vision of where we're headed in Next.js. But two, we want to make it a pretty easy change. So if you want the behavior that exists today with Next.js 14, it's just a one-line change. You can kind of stick with what you're doing and move on with your day. If you like it, that's great. But for people who are starting fresh, we want to slowly introduce these concepts of, okay, I talked to my database. Now my page is running dynamically. Now, what do I do from here? Well, I want to be able to understand which part of my page is static and dynamic. And we've been working now for about a year on uh, experimental feature called, called partial pre-rendering. And ultimately this is effectively what Next.js will become. It will be the default way of building with the app router. So we're really taking time to listen and experiment and hear how people are trying this out, what's working, what's not working, how it's working for us at Vercel, because ultimately this will be the, uh, the morphed version of what the app router is. That makes sense. I think the reason why maybe for myself and uh, uh, quite a few people that they're okay with the caching behavior now is I got into Next.js when the app router was live. 
So like I literally like the frame of mind I had of Next.js was what the app router was. I actually had to learn the pages router because uh, I had some work I had to do for an existing application. And so that was a, like a new learning for me, right? So I, I think that kind of makes sense. Now, are the caching behaviors, let's say, in server components, server actions, and regular API routes, are they all the same or do they sort of differ? Yeah, quickly on that one, um, before we jump into it, I think that you bring up a really good point, which is that for people learning Next.js from scratch, they don't know about the history of the past and why the decisions were made and how it's evolved over time. And we try to design the framework for those people. It seems a little counterintuitive because you'd think we would design it for the people starting from day one. But the people starting from day one understand the progression over time. And they can be brought along more for why we're making the changes. Of course, we still care about their opinion. But people starting from scratch have this completely fresh view of the world. I think for a lot of those people, trying to pre-render as much of the page as possible actually makes a lot of sense. So I want to keep that behavior in Next.js for sure. Now, going back to your question around caching in server actions, server components, et cetera, server actions are never cached. So those always run dynamically. Um, server components, the default now and in Next.js 15 is that when you run next build, the pages will try to be pre-rendered. So this is a common misconception with server components, which is, oh, I mark my component as async and I await some data. There's no way for me to ever generate a static page from this. It says server component. That means that it runs dynamically on the server. It's done. The reality is that even though you can have a server component that fetches data, that can still be pre-rendered during the build. It doesn't have to run dynamically when a user's request comes in. And that's really powerful. You can do yeah. a lot of interesting things with that. Yeah. Um, same thing with route handlers, where uh, with route handlers, they are effectively an API endpoint. You can kind of think about them as the, the base that all of the pages inside of Next.js build on top of. You can tell this because they share a lot of the same configuration yeah. options. For route handlers too, the default in Next.js 15, they will not be cached. But then if you want to cache them, you still have the ability to do that very easily and pre-render those during a build. That makes sense. Uh, I think that clears up a lot of things. Now, I know you, actually, the, the one thing you said, how Next.js, you guys kind of focus on people who have that fresh lens. And, you know, what I find very interesting is I think, like I did a video, it, it was a joke, you could check it out, where I compared Next.js versus Laravel and why Laravel is better than Next.js. And every example I showed was a blank page. So I was basically a joke, it was a meme. A lot of people got offended. Um, but the reason genuinely I, I, I believe that is because, again, from my point of view, React was the first framework I really built something that was tangible, that I can send someone a link. And then Next.js, truthfully, was the first dollar I made. Like web development was Next.js, right? So not only do I have an affinity to the framework, but it also makes sense to me. Like I genuinely understand the framework. And I think a lot of people, especially who might be boot camp grads or self-taught, like the app router sort of makes sense to them, right? It's a lot of the engineering terms that don't make sense to them. And that's why I try to use this channel to clear those things up and kind of make it, you know, understandable in a, in a fun way. And I, I like that approach from Next.js where, you know, someone who already knows engineering CS can pick things up really easily. But for someone who's new, fresh out of boot camp, this, this, that, it can get a little confusing. So um, that, that makes sense. Now, you talked about partial pre-rendering. And I looked at the site. I know you guys have the domain partialprerendering.com. Can you kind of maybe give us the Sparks Note version of what that is and what that future entails? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think... To your point around there being a lot of new terms, maybe potentially confusing terms, new things like partial pre-rendering, like is this something I need to know what it is? Do I need to know how it works? I think that because the app router is still relatively new in the web development ecosystem, Next.js has been around since 2016, so it's still relatively new. For a lot of people, we're having to convince them that this is worth the time for them to check out. 
So they are already using Next.js maybe on the pages router or they're using another framework. So part of the convincing of, hey, this is what it provides, this is some of the features it offers, can sometimes end up being the list of confusing words because it's like it has this really advanced, super cool feature that the people who are power users like love. And that's great, but I want to also make sure, you know, kudos to your channel for not alienating beginners as well by saying, awesome, it's great that we have these features, but at the end of the day, we're probably all just trying to learn something new, make some money from a side project or our job, and probably don't care about all of those little things. So the only thing really I'll say about partial pre-rendering for now is it's experimental. So you don't really need to know about too much of it yet, but it's it is basically what we're doing from the first couple years of feedback on the app router to figure out how we make the model of using Next.js even more intuitive for the next generation of developers. You already have the knowledge now of having learned the app router, knowing some of the intricacies of how it works, caching and all these bits. But if somebody starts fresh tomorrow, we want to make it even easier for them or six months or in a year from now. No, that makes sense. And I think, you know, what the, the kind of the battle that Next.js has is uh, Next.js is powerful enough for a big corporation to use and scale to billions, but it's also easy enough for someone to pick up. And obviously, sometimes there's trade-offs to be made. And I think it's this balance that, you know, I, I think you guys are doing a great job. Again, people call me a fanboy and I, I claim it. Uh, no shame in that. But yeah, I think that makes sense for caching. Next.js 15, you say, will. Um, be different, but I think it, it, it all makes sense. If I want my default way of things, I just have to add one line and yeah, I'm a happy, yeah. I'm a happy character. Yeah, and I, I think the goal too is it's not to, I, I think what a lot of folks hear like next year's 15, they're like, wait, we were just on 14. Yeah, it's a meme, it's <laughs> why a meme. Are we, why are we releasing all these new things? The the hope, for especially for newer folks who might not have as much eco, um, ecosystem experience with semantic versioning, Next.js 15, just being extremely pedantic with semantic versioning, just means that there's a breaking change. It doesn't necessarily mean that there's a whole new model to learn or everything is changing. And what we try to do to make that upgrade path as easy as possible is give uh, give folks commands they can run to automatically update their code if possible or provide documentation and upgrade guides. So I like to help folks think like, okay, just because it's a major version, that doesn't necessarily mean that you have to relearn everything. Um, going forward, uh, we're going to try to be more selective about major versions <laughs> just because I, I do feel yeah. like from a beginner standpoint, it is overwhelming to see like, yeah. okay, 13, 14, 15. Yeah. It's not like a new PlayStation is dropping. Yeah. It makes sense. I think. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I wish this was like the PS6, but it really, it's just like a new, you know, the NCAA football game drops, like it's just a little bit better. Or a new colorway. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. 